And truth was lost and hearts were frozen From you Allah came a prophet chosen Blessed prophet Muhammad obedient to you Taught us the things we ought to do He taught us for certain that you are one And that you have neither a daughter nor son He taught us to be good to our mother and father And that paradise lies under the feet of our mother I love you, my prophet And sing your praise And follow your sunnah Prophetic ways I love you, my prophet And sing your praise And follow your sunnah Prophetic ways Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah Welcome to Back to the Prophet. In this show, we're examining the life example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, as a guide to furthering our understanding of Islam, whether from the Quran or the Hadiths of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. In the example of the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, we truly have a beautiful model of conduct for ourselves. And he was in his character and standard of ethics and morality uh, a true living example of the teachings of the Holy Quran. We may read some verses of the Quran or some hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we may be confused with its meaning or how it relates to other verses or other statements. But if we refer back to the character and example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, inshallah, God willing, we will be enlightened and we will be able to better apply Islam in our own daily lives wherever we happen to live today. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, received the initial revelations of the Holy Qur'an at the age of 40, after having led an exemplary life among his people as uh, an honored, respected, well-trusted member of society. But when, in middle age, he started to proclaim the message of the Holy Qur'an, warning his people against the evil and wickedness and oppression which existed in their society, whether it was the evil of worshipping idols, making others to be worthy of that which belongs only to God alone, or the evil which they inflicted on unfortunate members of the human uh, species, the poor, the needy, and the oppressed peoples in Arabia at that time. And so they did not receive his message well. They accused him of being insane, possessed, or uh, lying, or making it up, or many other accusations which they hurled toward the Prophet ﷺ. But his own beautiful conduct and high standard of moral character best, are the best proof of the truth of his message. That is, somebody who for 40 years lived as an honest, trustworthy, hard-working citizen, known to be upstanding citizen in every respect, why would he suddenly, at age 40, start forging lies against God in his community, especially when there was no material benefit from forging a message like the Qur'an? He could not benefit financially, nor would he receive any power or recognition or reputation among his people. But in fact, he was giving up everything in his life for the sake of this message. People then questioned the reality of revelation. They did not believe that God actually sends revelation from heaven. Uh, it's strange, but the Arab people at that time were very modern in some of their attitudes. Like many people today, they were purely materialistic. And they often doubted the existence of God, the existence of angels, life after death, or the idea of revelation or scripture. And so the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was confronting opposition at that time, which is very relevant 
to people today. So a lot of people today don't really believe in such a thing as revelation or inspiration. And in fact, they use the word inspiration to mean, for example, that suddenly I had a good idea and I followed up on that idea and got a good result. And so I was inspired to do that. And so they don't take it literally to mean they were inspired by God. And they use the word revelation also today. Uh, whenever some new thing occurs to me, a new thought I had not understood before, had not thought before, they say, yeah, that was a revelation. And so a lot of people are very dismissive of the idea of divine revelation, that God in some way literally conveys his words to his human prophet or messenger. And so they imagine that the prophet is simply a very intelligent human being given to philosophy and deep thought and suddenly has some powerful ideas and proclaims that message to human beings. And so the message would really be from within himself, not externally coming from God or descending from heaven or through the angel but it's actually just part of the human genius. So by that way of understanding, the prophet wouldn't be much different from any great philosopher or thinker or scientist or leader who was brilliant and came up with great solutions in his particular circumstances, in his country, in his time and place. But the Quran refutes these ideas. And the idea that Muslims could entertain the idea that that the revelation wasn't really from God. But as some Muslims claim today, it was sort of an overflowing of his inward spirit and his truthfulness overflowing in his consciousness. But the Quran makes it clear that that is not the case. And in Surah Al-Najm, chapter 53 of the Quran, Allah Almighty says, وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنَ الْهَوَىٰ Neither does he, that is the Prophet, Neither does he speak out of his own desire. The hawa is your own personal whims or desires. That which is coming from within you, not that which is external to you. And so this verse of the Quran is saying, the Prophet Muhammad when he was speaking the words of the Holy Quran, proclaiming his message, he was not proclaiming that from any desire within himself or any a uh, conscious desire or input from his mind, but it was something external to himself. In huwa illa wahyun yuha. It is, that is the Quran, is but a divine inspiration or wahi, a revelation with which he is being inspired. And so this Quran is wahyun yuha. That is a revelation, but it's here in the name, Wahi, which is revelation, inspiration, Yuha, which is inspired or revealed to him. That is by an outside source. And so it's Yuha coming from someone else. And so it is not something from within his mind or his consciousness, but from his Lord, Allah Almighty. And the next verse talks about the receiving of, of the revelation through the angel Gabriel, Jibra'il, alayhi salatu wasalam, alamahu shadidul qawa, that he was taught by the mighty one, that is the angel Gabriel. So he is something that was imparted to him or taught to him by a very great source, a majestic source, which is the angel. Du miratin fastawa. The angel endowed with surpassing power, who in time manifested himself in his true nature or shape. So he appeared to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in his true majestic nature, filling the horizons. And he appeared to him in human form. And the revelation also came to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as the ringing of a bell the vibrations or the uh, uh, toning of a bell within his mind or in his heart. وَهُوَ بِالْأُفَقِ الْأَعْلَى 
That is, the angel was in the highest parts of the horizon when witnessed by the prophet. Then drew near to him and came close. فَكَانَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَوْ أَدْنَى Until he was two bow's lengths, two bow lengths, the length of a bow, or even nearer to him. فَأَوْحَى إِلَّا أَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْحَى And so Allah, in this way, imparted the revelation that he willed to the Prophet Muhammad. فَأَوْحَى إِلَّا أَبْدِهِ His servant, the Prophet, who is his servant and messenger, مَا أَوْحَى that which Allah chose to reveal. So the message that was received by the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, through the angel Gabriel came from Allah and Allah sent to him what Allah desired for him to speak. Hawa. He does not speak on his own behalf nor his own ideas or his own decisions. And in fact, he lived among his people as a respected member of society and he never at any stage used to stand in the marketplace or in the mosque proclaiming any message to his people, uh, giving them any recipe for success or salvation from destruction in this life or in the hereafter. But when this message came to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, from Allah, then there was an immediate transformation of his personality from being as a mild-mannered businessman to being suddenly the Prophet standing in public, enduring ridicule for the sake of proclaiming this message to, uh, for the sake of God Almighty. مَا كَذَبَ الْفُعَادُ مَا رَأَى The heart of the servant of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, did not give lie to what he saw. That is, in his mind, he knew very well what he saw. And so he was not deluded, his heart was not uh, confused, and he was not uh, making up something that did not actually happen, but this was something that he actually saw. <laughs> Will they, that is his opponents then, argue with him and contend with him as to what he saw? And so the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, actually saw the angel Gabriel physically, and it wasn't simply something he saw in his mind or in his heart. It wasn't simply an imagination or an overflowing of his spirit or his intellect or intelligence. But he saw the angel Gabriel on the heavens. We're going to go back. We're going to go to a break and we'll be back shortly. Assalamu alaikum. I love you, my prophet, and sing your praise and follow your sunnah, prophetic way. The Philosophy of Islamic Law, a program for restoring belief and trust within Muslims' mind and heart, and for re-establishing a true concept about Islamic rules for others. And sing your praise and follow your sunnah prophetic way. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to our program. We're discussing the revelation of the Holy Quran to the Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. The Arab people, especially his own relatives and clansmen of Quraysh, were very skeptical of the idea of divine revelation. And they believed this was some kind of delusion or forgery or illness or sickness on the part of the Prophet Muhammad. But the Quran bears witness in chapter 53, Surah Al-Najm, that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, physically saw the angel Gabriel and received the revelation from Allah that Allah willed to inspire upon him that he did not in any way uh, make up or produce this Qur'an or compose it from his own thoughts or in his own imagination in any way. But the majority of the leaders of Quraysh were not receptive to this message. 
not because they didn't trust the Prophet Muhammad, and not even because they didn't respect the Qur'an, but they heard the powerful message of the Qur'an, and they were convinced that this was something unique. Nobody had ever heard anything like it in Arabia. And it was coming from one of their own, one of their own close relatives and a respected member of their community. But what really turned them away from the Qur'an was the demand of the Qur'an that since there is one Lord, one God, one Creator for all, we have to worship Him directly. We have to not worship Him through the idols and the intermediaries that we have made up and that we have placed as obstacles between us and Allah. Because an intermediary, in the end, is standing between you and God and therefore is blocking the paths to the truth revealed from our Lord Allah Almighty. And so, if we can go to God without an intermediary, and God created all of us, we are all His servants and we're all equals. None of us is superior because of our birth or our blood. Whether we are the heirs of Abraham or any prophet or messenger or the lowest person of any race or tribe or nation, we are all essentially equal as servants and worshipers of God Almighty. And so they would never give up the traditions of their ancestors because the traditions of their ancestors said, you are the superior people and you have the right to rule over the Arabs and the Arab people must follow you and obey you. You have the right to enslave whomever you desire. And so their traditions gave them a superiority. And they imagined they were special and chosen by birth and given privileges which were not enjoyed by other human beings. In fact, all of us are chosen by Allah. If we desire to humble ourselves and serve Allah, that is the highest position of His chosen servants as the prophets and messengers and the salihin and righteous people and the siddiqeen, the true believers in all eras and all times, are modest and humble servants and ibad of Allah Almighty. But the proud and arrogant can never be true servants and they are never chosen by Allah. That is why Allah chose the humble, modest prophet Muhammad for carrying and conveying his message, not the proud and vain leaders of Quraysh. And so the people who em embrace Islam initially, other than some of the close friends and uh, family members of the Prophet Muhammad, were some of the poorest people, slaves and outsiders in the community. One was the, uh, were Yasir and Sumeya and their son Ammar. And they were slaves of Quraysh. And Amar ibn Yasir, the son of Amar and Sumeya, was a freed slave. And they very happily embraced the message of Islam. But immediately their masters took them out in the desert to torture them to death in the sun. And Amar ibn Yasir, even though he was a believing Muslim and his father and mother had embraced the message of the Qur'an, he watched his parents being tortured to death in front of his eyes. And they refused to renounce Islam and they passed away as martyrs, died as shuhada, as giving testimony to the oneness of Allah and to their great faith. But Ammar bin Yasir, after having seen this horrible thing in front of him, when it came time for him to be tortured, they said, you have to denounce Islam or else we're going to put you to death. And even though his heart was full of faith, he denounced Islam in order to save his life and pretended to embrace the religion of Quraysh, the idol worship of their ancestors. And this was a very important situation that happened in that time because the Quran came down, chapter 16, Surah Al-Nahl of the Holy Quran, uh, verse 106. Man kafra billahi min badi imanihi. As for one who denies God after having faith, this is a very grave sin that you would deny Allah after having achieved faith and having heard the message of Islam and the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad and then knowingly deny Allah. Illa man ukriha wa qalbahu mutma'innun bil iman. Except for that person who is forced to do so, who is coerced by force, yet his heart is full of faith in God Almighty, in Iman, 
And so in his heart, he has complete trust to Allah Almighty. So we can only understand the outward words and deeds of a person. But Allah knows what is in their heart, what is in their essence, in their mind and soul. And so Amar was forced by threat of death and torture to denounce Islam. But he did so even though his heart was full of Iman. And so Allah said, مَنْ شَرَحَ بِالْكُفْرِ صَدْرًا فَعَلَيْهِمْ غَضَبٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَذِيمٌ But as for those who, while his heart, uh, who willingly opens up his heart to kufr, that is, he willingly embraces the rejection of Allah after having understood the truth clearly upon such falls, the condemnation and wrath of God and tremendous suffering awaits them in the world to come. But the person who denies Islam to save their life is forgiven by Allah Almighty. Therefore, Islam did not come so that we should be suffered, so we should suffer or be tortured or killed. And so if a person chooses by being forced and threatened and having their life, the gun is put to their head, they can deny Islam to save their life. Allah Almighty wants you to have a good life. That is why he revealed Islam and sent the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so that we can have a beautiful life on this earth of iman and faith and uh, paradise in the world to come. So Allah does not want us to suffer or endure more hardship than a human can possibly bear. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وصعها that Allah does not make you bear a burden which is unbearable. And so a Muslim is allowed to deny Islam to save his or her life on condition that as soon as they're safe and secure, they openly return back to their faith and practice their Islam. Another slave who embraced Islam was Bilal ibn Rabah, also a slave from Ethiopia. And he was actually the slave of Umayyah ibn Khalaf. And Umayyah also took Bilal out to force him and tortured him into submission to force him to deny Islam. And they would put him out in the hot desert on the sand and put boulders on his chest uh, until he was suffocating and ready to die. And he would keep only repeating over and over again, Ahad, Ahad, the oneness of God, the oneness of God, denying any partner or any associate with Allah Almighty. And this was the way of life in the early era in Mecca. The Prophet himself suffered greatly. His own aunt would throw thorns on his path and sharp sticks so that when he came out at dawn for prayers, he would step on those and injure his feet. And they threw filth and garbage on him during prayer. Uh, when the pilgrimage time would come and Mecca would be full of visitors coming to visit the sanctuary of Abraham, the Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him. A descendant of Abraham was anxious to share with those pilgrims the religion of Abraham, Miletu Ibrahim. But his own uh, friends and family members, such as Al-Walid ibn Mughira, one of the Quraysh leaders, would go to the people and warn them, be careful, be aware that this person Muhammad is going to be in there, he's insane and stay away from him so the people would be scared to hear him or listen to his message. And they would say, he's a sahir, he's going to do magic on you or like hypnosis and you're going to be led astray by his magic or his powers over you. Or they would say he's a shair, a poet who is making up poetry and so would not be actually taken seriously in the society. Or that he was insane, he is majnoon, a possessed person who is not responsible for himself. But if any normal person would look, they would see he was of high, norm, high moral character. He was not like an evil magician or sorcerer, nor was he uh, behaving like an insane person, a possessed person, nor did he pronounce poetry, but he pronounced a unique and beautiful revelation that had never been heard before in Arabia. So they said the best thing we can say about him is he's a sahir, because the sahir, the, the magician or the um, sorcerer, when he does magic, he causes the husband and wife to break up. Or he causes the, brother, the family to break up and to divide and hate one another. And so when the teachings of Islam come to people, 
Sometimes the wife embraces Islam and the husband does not, and they separate. Or sometimes one bro brother embraces Islam and the other does not, and so they separate. So he's very close to a sorcerer. And so they scared people, beware of the mad sorcerer Muhammad, don't listen to him, and don't let him have power over you. And so the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had to be very patient and endure a great deal of persecution and suffering in Mecca, all kinds of false accusations, none of which had any connection to the content of his revelation or the content of his character, both of which were unimpeachable and above any criticism by any just and fair observer. And so no matter how badly the Prophet suffered, no matter how badly his companions suffered and were uh, abused and persecuted, they were patient and steadfast in preserving this message of the Qur'an and relaying it to all of us. We all have received this message only because of their difficulties and their patience. May Allah reward them. May Allah all guide all of you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. When truth was lost and hearts were frozen From you, Allah came a prophet chosen Blessed prophet Muhammad, obedient to you Taught us the things we ought to do He taught us for certain that you are one And that you have neither a daughter nor son he taught us to be good to our mother and father And that paradise lies under the feet of our mother I love you, my prophet, and sing your praise And follow your sunnah, prophetic ways I love you, my prophet, and sing your praise And follow your sunnah, prophetic ways